And yes, uh, one last thing. Uh, 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 we address. Hi, Abhishek. Abhishek, put your microphone on. I mean, we can't hear you. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Uh, we can hear you. So, how are you? I hope that uh, we didn't disturb you in the morning. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I just have some connection issue at my place, but uh, I'm sorry about the being late for a couple of minutes. Okay, okay. So without delay, we will start the program. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, shall I start? No, I'll ask. Uh, uh, I'll ask one of my uh, students to welcome you, right? And also the audience and uh, introduce sure. the team. Thank you. Prakya, take over. Okay. Good morning to one and all present here. It takes me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the online lecture series as presented by Intersections Banaras Hindu University, which is an informal academic platform under the aegis of Faculty of Arts, Banaras Hindu University. The purpose of this online lecture series is to address young minds of scholars academicians and mostly PG students and bring about an awareness of the recent and ongoing studies in the sphere of academics. Today, we have among us an esteemed speaker, Dr. Avishek Paroi, who is presently working as an assistant professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Madras and is an Associate Fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy. Sir has done his PhD from the Department of English Studies, Durham University. His research interests include modernism, masculinity studies, culture studies, and memory studies. Sir has been selected as the executive member of modernist studies in Asia. He has won the Minakshi Mukherjee Prize 2019 for the best published paper of the year by the Indian Association for Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies for his paper entitled, What's the Use of Stories That Aren't Even True? Agency, Fabulation, and the Epistemology of the Story Telling Self in Salman Rushdie's Harun and the Sea of Stories. So without further delay, I, on behalf of Intersections Banaras Hindu University, welcome you, sir. Before we begin, yeah. yes, sir. Before we begin, I have a few requests for the participants. Participants are requested to put their questions in the chat box. All the questions will be attended Mama. in the question answer session, which shall be conducted post lecture. And all the questions shall be read out by me in a chronological order. I also humbly request all the participants to mute themselves and not to share their screen. Thank you. Once again, I welcome you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, for a very kind introduction, Bhutsuki, and thank you very much for uh, having me as speaker, Vivek. Uh, am I audible perfectly, to everyone? Yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah, wonderful. So this particular workshop is about memory study. So what I am aiming to do is give a very generic idea of this particular research cluster uh, in terms of what we are interested in in memory studies, what is the kind of research that we do, and how does it connect to uh, other disciplines such as psychology, cultural studies, and obviously military studies, because uh, we are grouped in military studies, and anything that we are doing is from the domain of military studies. So how does it connect to other disciplines? Uh, what is the future of this kind of research, and what are the possibilities that can happen uh, if one is interested in this uh, kind of research? So as some of you will know, uh, we at IIT Madras, we have our uh, memory studies cluster, and we had the first annual conference on memory studies, uh, the first one in India uh, last year, which was uh, commemorating the 100th year of Jalimwala Park Massacre. 
uh, and we were about to have one this year, but obviously with the COVID complications, that hasn't responded. But we very much hope to have an annual conference uh, uh, series from every uh, international conference on memory sticks. Uh, so maybe in 2021, we'll have something else uh, on a bigger scale. But let me start with what we did. Uh, let me start with the event that we did last year uh, in terms of connecting that to this discipline of memory studies. So Jalil Wallabak Massacre, um, as all of us know, was one of the uh, biggest and most brutal events in the history of Indian um, the freedom struggle, uh, which happened in Amritsar, uh, 1919. And it was uh, obviously a massive event. People were killed, uh, brutally killed, uh, peaceful civilians, women, children. Uh, everyone was fired at uh, indiscriminately by General Dyer uh, as per his instructions. And it has gone down as one of the bloodiest events uh, in British imperial history. Now, I will start with an anecdote, uh, a story which will connect to this particular historical event, and then I'll use that story, an anecdote, to connect the uh, broader domain of this research. Okay, so um, this is the story, an anecdote of what happened to me when I was in my PhD in Durham. I had a friend, um, um, a very good friend, a very liberal, uh, open and open-minded person, uh, very critical of imperialism. Uh, and then he wanted to watch a film with me. You know, he was very interested in the movies and in the cinema, but he wanted to watch a film, a volume film. So we started watching this uh, film called Rangde Vasanti, which I'm sure is familiar to most of you. And uh, those of you who've seen the film would know there is a scene in the film uh, which depicts the Jalim Balabar massacre. Uh, very grotesquely uh, in a black and white slow down secret, slowed down secrets. Uh, it obviously stylizes it uh, to, to convey the gruesomeness, the grotesqueness of the spectacle. Uh, now, I remember when you're watching that film, that particular scene, this friend of mine got very disturbed. Uh, he got up and paused the film, and then he asked me point blank that, uh, you know, imperialism was a terrible thing, I'm aware of it. But this particular incident of Jalim Wadabad Massacre did it really take place, or is it just fiction that has been represented in this particular film? Uh, which came as a surprise to me, because it was very hard for me to believe that uh, uh, someone as well read, well traveled, and someone as liberal as this person of mine, uh, this friend of mine, uh, wasn't even aware of Jalim Wadabad Massacre as a British person. So I asked him, uh, why wasn't he aware? And his answer was very. Blunt. He said, well, I'm not aware because it's never taught to us in history books. It's never taught to us uh, in our school history, you know, in the history books that we study as we grow up. Uh, so I'm not aware of it. Now that was, that, that moment was uh, very revelatory for me. And that I often look back at the moment as one of those uh, tipping points in my thinking, uh, in my thought processes, which led me to what I do now in memory studies. And that is uh, the whole part of memory, the whole package of memory, the whole uh, architecture of memory, something which is disseminated and consumed uh, through very textual processes. Uh, and obviously, by textual process, I mean discursive processes, processes which inform uh, discourse formation, uh, processes which inform text or text information. And obviously, these processes are very strategic in quality. Uh, there are certain events which are constantly replayed and remembered, and I use the word remember with the hyphen over here, uh, remembered organically, effectively, through emotions, through discourses, through you know, architecture, through monuments, uh, through memorials, through museums, uh, different kinds of structures, uh, discursive structures. And equally, there are certain events which are conveniently dismembered, right? And again, I'm using dismembered with the hyphen over here. Uh, mem uh, events which are not replayed, events which are not uh, you know, remembered, events which are not commemorated. Uh, and, and again, this decision is a very strategic decision. The decision to dismember uh, is very strategic. Uh, so, for example, um, this is a case in point that I just story that is told you that uh, a generation uh, close to mine in Britain today has no idea of Jenny Wall about Massacre. Uh, chiefly because this that particular event in British history uh, is, is, is been dismembered, deliberately dismembered, uh, and that decision to dismember uh, is a strategic, political, discursive decision. Uh, now that brings me to a very fundamental point uh, in this particular cluster of research, and that's the point that I want to start with, and that is that we in memory studies, uh, ironical as it may sound, 
we are actually more interested in the phenomenon of forgetting rather than remembering, right? So we are more interested in uh, how certain things get forgotten, uh, and more importantly, why certain events get forgotten. So we are looking at forgetting and remembering not as ontological opposites of each other, but as connected categories. Uh, so forgetting and remembering, they operate simultaneously, they operate in a, in a connection, in a dialogue form. And that is something which we know, not just as a political process, but also as a psychological process. So uh, those of us who are interested in the psychology of memory, you know, in terms of looking at some of the uh, neuroscientific work on memory today, we know that uh, you know, forgetting is not considered as the opposite of memory. Forgetting is considered rather as a cognitive component of memory. In other words, if you are to remember, you must be able to forget. So forgetting is an ability uh, to a certain extent. Uh, you must be able to forget. The brain is hardwired to forget, right? So we must be able to forget certain information. We must be able to forget certain data uh, in order to carry on you know, the seamless process uh, of navigation with the world outside. And this navigation with the world outside, I, I use the term uh, embodiment to, to talk about this. You know, embodiment is a very complex category uh, in memory studies research. Uh, there is a, there's an embedded quality about embodiment. It happens in the body, it happens uh, in the neurons, in the head, it happens uh, in a very cellular form, in a very cellular neural form, and hence the embedded quality about embodiment. But equally, there is an extended quality about embodiment in terms of how it connects to the world outside, in terms of how it extends outside and connects to the apparent uh, the material that goes to the outside. So this loop between the embedded and the extended uh, is something that we are interested in. And obviously, uh, embodiment has a lot to do with memory and uh, sort of unmemory or forgetting. In other words, uh, how we control our sense of self, how we connect to the world outside, depends on what we remember, and also equally depends on what we do not remember. Right? So forgetting becomes a very crucial component of embodiment. Uh, that's something which we know from psychology today, that is something which we know from neuroscience today, that we must be able to forget in order to remember, and all, more importantly, we must be able to forget uh, in order to have this sort of fluid sense of self, this seamless sense of self. So because you know the sense of self, um, the, the biggest solution that we need to have in order to have our sense of self is seamlessness, right? We must be able to seamlessly navigate with anything around us. There must be no break, there must be no interruption in our sense of self. And when the interruption happens, uh, that becomes a, a condition, that becomes a problem, that becomes a medical condition, that becomes an existential condition. So we talk about trauma patients, we talk about people who suffer from different kinds of you know, blunt injury or, or PTSD or anything of that sort. And that, that can be conceptually considered as an interruption in our understanding of the self. In other words, our seamless, endless idea of the self, the solution of this endless self becomes interrupted during such, uh, uh, during such events, during such incidents, trauma being uh, a good case in point. So, uh, in other words, what, we, what I'm trying to do here is we're looking at memory as a very complex phenomenon, something which happens uh, in the body, in the brain, uh, in our biological self, but also memory as a cultural phenomenon, something also a macro collective activity. Right. Uh, I mean, in either way, in both cases, memory becomes an activity, and that's that's the way you look at memory uh, in this particular research cluster. Memory as an activity, mem memory as an act of reconstruction, and this reconstruction model is something which is corroborated uh, by scientists today. So we look at memory today not as recollection, uh, not as a passive process of recall, but as an active process of reconstruction. And obviously, when I'm using the word reconstruction, what I'm doing is I'm giving a very textual quality about memory. Memory as a text, the brain as a text, a text which can be, which is plastic in quality, a text which is elastic in quality, uh, a text which can be molded, a text which can be replayed and reconstructed. So there's a very interesting uh, post-structuralist way to look at memory. And um, you know, interestingly enough, that post-structuralist understanding of memory, the post-structuralist uh, understanding of the brain is something which is corroborated by scientists today. 
uh, by neuroscientists today. Perhaps I'm going to talk about, uh, later about um, some of these figures, some of the scholars, which may be helpful in terms of bridging post-structuralism and memory studies, in terms of bridging uh, post-structuralism and trauma studies. But at this moment, I just want to re-emphasize the uh, phenomenon of forgetting. Uh, I just want to re-emphasize how memory and forgetting become simultaneous activities and how we need to take a look at memory as an activity in reconstruction. Uh, and obviously, the moment I use the word activity or reconstruction, we realize, uh, especially we in literary studies, we realize that this is something which has um, unreliability and bias embedded in it. Right? So the, uh, the brain is a biased machine. We know that today. Uh, through scientific research, the brain is hardwired to be uh, biased. Uh, we have color bias, we have event bias, we have taste bias, we have smell bias. So, in all these biases are very much part of the neural package, which is the brain. Right. So, bias becomes a very important uh, uh, phenomenon uh, of any kind of sensual process. Our uh, memory being one of them. Right. So, uh, when we remember something uh, or how we remember something, it all depends on how we are biased uh, to remember. So we remember certain things more than certain other things. That's uh, the way we memory. We, we experience memory in our daily discourses of life, right? Uh, so the bias becomes a very important um, you know, component of the memory process, as is unreliability. And as I just mentioned, uh, forgetting becomes a cognitive component of the memory. Uh, in other words, uh, forgetting becomes part of the process of memory. So when we remember something, we are also, at that point in time, uh, forgetting something. Right, so uh, forgetting becomes uh, sort of it informs the memory process to a certain extent, uh, and that becomes important for us to remember. So, uh, in other words, when you remember something, we must be able to imagine uh, what we have forgotten. Uh, so, imagination or interpretation becomes a very important component of the memory. Uh, it's not just about information; it's also about how we interpret that information. Okay, so uh, interpretation of information becomes a very important component of the entire memory process. Uh, and that is why uh, the whole idea of reconstruction comes in. Uh, if, because if we're looking at the activity of memory as a textual process, uh, interpretation must be a very core component of that particular process, right? So interpretation and information, that entanglement uh, is important for us today in terms of looking at memory uh, in a micro category, in a micro neural category. One second. Uh, micro uh, neural category, something which happens in the brain, but also uh, as a collective macro cultural category. Uh, so we are interested in memory studies and looking at this loop, shall we say, between memory as a micro activity and memory as a macro activity. So this sort of memory as a, a personal, private, existential neural phenomenon and memory as a collective cultural political phenomenon. Because in both cases, forgetting becomes uh, a very important uh, component uh, in terms of how we remember, right? So, uh, for example, uh, if you look at writers, uh, literary writers, and this is where literature becomes interesting, because literature has this very unique quality of offering us uh, very intense personal experiences, uh, which are internal, existential, uh, interiorized in terms of looking inside itself. Uh, but also equally, uh, it's equally important, um, equally suitable, talk about uh, you know, cultural events, talk about historical events, talk about collective events, macro events. So literature as a medium, or fiction uh, more importantly, as a medium, has this unique ability to be embedded as well as extended. Uh, what I just mentioned about embodiment. So uh, it becomes a very important vehicle uh, to uh, understand embodiment, to describe embodiment. Uh, so unsurprisingly, uh, fiction is something which is taken very seriously by neuroscientists today. So, uh, for example, if you read the works of uh, V.S. Ramachandran, uh, who is one of the biggest uh, neuroscientists working on the phantom limb, uh, if you take a look at the works of Antonio Damasio, uh, who writes uh, books in philosophy and neuroscience, talks about Aikra, uh, Spinoza, and other philosophers on cognition, you find that uh, the, all of these people, Eric Kendall, again, a very big name, uh, Joseph Ledoux, uh, these are just some of the figures uh, who are the major neuroscientists in the world today. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to engage with these uh, concepts later in the Q&A session. Uh, but we find that you know these people, these neuroscientists, they are increasingly interested uh, in fiction, in literature, uh, in terms of how the medium of fiction that is uniquely capable of giving this uh, sort of entanglement between uh, the uh, the embedded quality of cognition 
and the extended quality of cognition. So cognition as a uh, as a neural category and cognition as a cultural category. So you know, in terms of looking at culture, uh, every culture is an economy of codes. But right? every culture has a very coded quality, uh, and that code is transferred across generations, long generations, uh, and also consumed uh, in a very intergenerational way. And each of these codes uh, that a culture contains, it contains bits of memory in it, uh, bits of remembrance in it, and also equally, uh, it contains things which are forgotten, right? So uh, for a culture to keep recording itself, uh, it must be able to uh, remember uh, certain events, and also equally, it must be able to dismember certain events. So the entire activity as, uh, of culture as recording, uh, it contains this entanglement between memory and forgetting. So just to go back to the anecdote I began with, uh, for British culture today, uh, we find that certain incidents about inheritance must be forgotten. Uh, it must it, it must not be contained uh, in the recording program uh, of British culture today. Right? So uh, we be glorified, they glorify, for example, uh, you know, people like Churchill, uh, who was just as racist, a genocidal maniac. Uh, he is a British war hero today. Uh, you know, and that, that again, the way Churchill is represented uh, in British culture today is a very good case in point. Because he is often voted. Uh, the British have this stupid tendency to have this who is the greatest Briton ever that only happens almost every year Britain. And Churchill is a consistent winner uh, in these polls. Uh, he is consistently voted as the greatest Briton ever, sometimes ahead of Shakespeare, ahead of Newton, or whatever other people you can think of. Whereas if you look at take a look at Churchill's track record as a racist, uh, as a genocidal person, we find that he is uh, in one of the he should be one of the most hated people uh, in the planet and in the human history. But then the way he has been recorded in the British culture, again, the, the concept of recording becomes uh, important because recording also contains the idea of representation and therein lies memories uh, connection with fiction. Because if fiction is an act of representation, then that's exactly how memory works uh, and as a cultural medium, the way we record certain events record certain figures uh, and then uh, represent them and consume them uh, uh, intergenerationally. So that becomes important in memory as well. So Jenny Mullabad is not a part of the recording program uh, in current British history. And it's hardly an apology about imperialism as we all know, and such a who talks about it uh, you know, in very, very elegant terms. Uh, so you know, the whole idea of the absence of apology and imperialism is something that we find uh, uh, in a rampant in British history. You know, the, 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 the whole attitude towards imperialism is, okay, that's, that's something which happened many years ago. We need to move on. Uh, yeah, we regret it, but we want to apologize for it. And the absence of apology uh, in terms of looking at imperialism is exactly because there is a complete rejection of any kind of engagement with imperialism, a refusal of, uh, to engage with imperialism and all this brutal details. So no one talks about Jalim Walabar. There's no taught in uh, GCS history in part of school textbooks and British kids. Uh, and again, uh, that omission is important. That forgetting is important. Right? So again, we're back to the uh, fundamental point with which we began uh, this session. The forgetting is not an innocent activity in memory. Forgetting is a, is a very manipulative activity. When you forget something, even neurally, in a, the way the brain forgets something, uh, you know, it is a very manipulative decision. The brain must be able to forget uh, in order to be at peace with the world outside, uh, in order to sustain itself functional embodiment, right? Uh, and sometimes when you cannot forget, uh, that becomes a problem. I mean, again, we look at uh, trauma victims, uh, and the reason they constantly suffer from trauma uh, is because, you know, trauma as a category uh, has renewal, you know, it, it's repetitive and quality. It must come back again and again in all this intensity. So, in other words, trauma victims, uh, you know, if they, if they manage to forget trauma, they, they are able to move on. But you know, with the case of PTSD, a post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, trauma becomes a recursive phenomenon. It just keeps recurring. Uh, and again, so the absence of forgetting becomes a problem in terms of trauma victims. So even in a, in a, in a very micro category, in a very neural category, uh, you know, Forgetting is a very important component of embodiment. Uh, and as a macro category, forgetting becomes a very important uh, component of the decoding process of culture. Right. So uh, the book, I'm writing a book at the moment, and it's about the whole idea of 
the entanglement of matter, metaphor, and memory. So how does matter become metaphor, and how does a metaphor end up into collective memory? And how is fiction uh, uniquely a suitable to sort of describe this entanglement as it were? Uh, so fiction, as I mentioned, uh, the fluidity of fiction becomes a very important uh, instrument, shall we say, in terms of describing this entanglement of matter, metaphor, and memory. Uh, because fiction is a fluid medium, and, 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 and use the word fluidity in a very conceptual, cognitive way. Because fiction is a, is a combination of historical reality, what really took place, and it combines the perspective with what could have taken place. And sometimes it makes it more complicated by saying what did not take place, but what should have taken place. So again, all these different perspectives are combined together. What did take place with what could have taken place and with what did not take place, but what should have taken place. So all these perspectives in mind together to get this very complex cognitive uh, structure to fiction, which makes it subversive in quality, which is why fiction books get banned more often than history books, because it also produces the possibilities of what could have happened uh, if there was no interference from the state, what could have happened if certain things were allowed, right? So, uh, for example, those of you interested in partition or edits will know that, you know, the representations of partition fiction are more moving, are more effective, are more disturbing uh, than, let's say, historical documents. If you read Mando, for example, uh, Mando's short stories, um, the way the entanglement of matter and metaphor are given, how matter becomes metaphor. For example, if you, if you remember the story of mistake or mistake, as it's represented by Mando, uh, how the matter becomes a metaphor of some kind of communal identity which becomes uh, uh, obviously the instrument of violence during partition. So you find that the, the fluidity of fiction is really unique in terms of offering that particular perspective uh, in terms of how we remember. So in other words, uh, we need to take a look at fiction as a very important medium in memory space. And unsurprisingly, as I just mentioned, more and more scientists are looking at fiction there. Uh, in terms of understanding how the first person point of view and a third person point of view can be combined uh, in one narrative. And V. S. Ramachandran has this really interesting theory where he says that that's the biggest challenge for neuroscience, combining the first person point of view and a third person point of view. In other words, the empirical point of view and the affective point of view. If you can combine these two together, then you get a very important, very interesting look uh, into the complexity of the human mind which, as neuroscientists agree today, is more complex than the brain. The brain is mathematical, the brain is neural, the brain is medical, but the mind is obviously more complex, cognitively speaking, than the brain. And the reason why the mind is more complex is because it's constantly combining the different points of view. Uh, it's constantly combining information with interpretation. It's, it's constantly combining uh, effect with effect, right? And this constant combination makes uh, memory studies a very fluid medium. Uh, and it's one of those uh, disciplines which is very organically interdisciplinary in quality. You don't have to make an effort uh, to be interdisciplinary in memory studies. It's very organically interdisciplinary because it contains psychology from the very beginning. We have to uh, read psychology books, neuroscience books, uh, some experiments in the human mind and cognition. Uh, and obviously, if you're rooted in little space like we are, uh, we need to take a look at that entire cognition through literature. Uh, how is literature capable uh, of offering us um, you know, glimpses into cognition, which are very, very important for us today, even from a scientific perspective. And then, of course, we have cultural studies. How does culture remember? Uh, how does uh, how is national, any nation's history, uh, an example of remembering and forgetting? I just mentioned Britain, uh, but then any, any nation in the world, the way the history books are written in any particular nation, but certain events must be forgotten. A certain evils must be omitted, a certain figures must be uh, sort of pushed away into the margins. And one write-up that I find very interesting uh, in terms of looking at the whole package of memory is a writer called uh, Milan Kundera. So if you read Kundera's book, The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, I find it's one of those textbooks really for me in terms of looking at the relationship between fiction and forgetting. Uh, and the very title of the book is about uh, you know the book of laughter and forgetting. So in that book, Kundera talks about how in a very complex chronotop, and again, I use the word chronotop from that team, uh, the capsule of space and time, a very handy metaphor for memory studies, chronotop. Uh, because when you remember something, you're remembering a, a, a capsule of space and time together. We not just remember Earth space or Earth time, but uh, 
remember, a compounder space and time. And that compound is that capsule is important for us, not in a very effective way. Uh, you know, if you remember any particular space, remembering the space at that particular point in time. So it's always a compound. So if you take that concept and come to Tonera, and if you read the book of Love and Forgetting, you find that how the, the way Prague is described in Tonera uh, is very, very interesting. It's very complex from above. Because it's that one city uh, which has seen many political events in communism, post communism, capitalism. Uh, so, you know, it, it keeps changing all the time. And again, uh, the memory of the city keeps changing all the time. Uh, the memory of space keeps changing all the time. In terms of what is remembered, replay over and over again, and how certain events, certain uh, uh, figures, certain incidents, certain memories uh, are forgotten. Uh, in a very deliberate way, they're not talked about, they're not commemorated, they're not textualized uh, through historical uh, documents or museums or archives. And this absence of archive becomes interesting. So the whole idea of the archive, those of us who read Gerilla would know, uh, the, whole, the whole ontology of the archive is very political. What gets included in an archive is as important, uh, sometimes less important than uh, what gets excluded, right? So what does not enter the archive becomes interesting. Uh, this, again, we were looking at the, the construction of absence uh, or the articulation of absence, uh, and this is where literature comes in. Literature becomes a very important medium uh, to articulate absence. Uh, what is not talked about, what is not part of the memory of the curse, right? that becomes a very big deal uh, in literature. So, uh, just to sum up, and again, I'm, I'm just giving you a summary of this kind of research, and obviously, you know, we can talk about this in more details in the humanization. And you also have to, uh, I'm also happy to engage in emails about this if anyone wants to know more about it for references. Uh, some of these figures, uh, I'm just going to give some figures now who are useful in terms of looking at this kind of research. Uh, Derrida, of course, is a very key figure uh, uh, for the intersection between critical theory and memory studies. Uh, so if you look at Derrida's work um, on the archive, because I mentioned the archive fever, uh, again, the whole idea of the whole relationship between the archive and authority. So yeah, there's a certain degree of authorization uh, that is very much part of the ontology of the archive. In order to be a part of the archive, you must be um, part of the authorization process. It must be, you must be authorized to access the archive. Uh, you must be authorized to enter the archive. So there must be a political decision in terms of what gets in the archive and what, in, what doesn't get in. Right? And equally interesting is the religious idea of spectrality. Right? What is really, what, what ceases to be mapped up, but still continues to be metaphorical uh, to a certain extent. Right? And again, if we're looking at a very complex combination of matter, metaphor, and memory, something that I'm interested in at uh, this point of time. Uh, and of course, if you read the readers' book, uh, for example, Spectres of Marx, uh, which is a very useful book, by the way, uh, to look at Kundera, because Kundera talks about uh, communism, Kundera talks about the absence of communism, the disappearance of communism from Texas of uh, but then that disappearance is never complete, uh, because forgetting, like remembering, is an incomplete process. And incompletion becomes a very important component of forgetting as well as memory. Uh, so, uh, the, the Prague in Kundera it continues to have this very spectral markers of communism uh, through architecture, through offices, different kinds of discourses. And the reader talks about the spectral quality of any kind of residual uh, 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 marker in Spectres of Marx, where he uses a very interesting term called ontology. Um, and a haunted ontology. The ontology is something which doesn't quite go away. It's still there as a spectral uh, presence. And um, obviously, he used the metaphor of Hamlet's father. And I've heard in Hamlet, for example, you find that Hamlet's father is an undead ghost. Uh, it doesn't quite disappear completely. Uh, he's not there as a matter. He has been killed. He's not there as a, as a material. He's been killed. But he's very much there as a metaphor. And it's very much there as part of the memory. So again, Albert's father becomes a very really key component, a very really key you know, figure to look at this matter, metaphor, uh, and memory thing. Uh, and the reader talks about that uh, in Spectres and Marx. So I'm just going to conclude now, uh, and I'll just give you one figure, one writer, uh, one, one critic that I think is very useful uh, currently uh, in terms of looking at a post structuralist understanding of the brain, a uh, post structuralist understanding of the self, the, the mind, trauma, etc. And then one person is uh, Captain Malibu. Uh, Malibu's work is very interesting uh, 
she talks about the plasticity, she talks about accident, uh, the ontology of the accident. So Malibu is a very important figure in terms of looking at, uh, and, and a very important structure perspective, uh, to look at cognition, look at trauma, uh, and she is a very key uh, figure in terms of this kind of research uh, of the, between the intersection between memory studies, trauma studies, and critical theory, obviously through the uh, medium of fiction. So I just uh, stop at this point. I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for your insightful lecture. I now invite Vivek, sir, for a discussion. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. I mean, uh, uh, I'm very delighted that within the 30 to 40 minutes, what you could do is uh, great for our students in the sense that as a PG student, they could understand what are the points that they are supposed to take away from your lecture. Second, uh, what I find very interesting is, is that now they can uh, also understand the literature they want to pursue research in the memory studies. So we are talking about this, uh, microactivity. Obviously, the literature student, we cannot talk in microactivity of the memory, but rather more microactivity of the memory. So uh, they can now look into it uh, and, and they can find it very interesting. Uh, arguments to put forward. But I wanted you to just have some light on it then because we have a lot of questions. So I'll not take much time. Just you could uh, quickly respond to my observations. Is this that when I was thinking of the memory studies, I was thinking that memory studies can also offer a very interesting ground for observing the uh, making of India. So, so let's say for example, when we assume that the memory power makes us, it extremely also becomes very important uh, for understanding how memory has been, what you have been talking uh, uh, in the last 30 minutes uh, over the century, the subject to manipulation, exploitation, by hegemonic states. So uh, uh, we have, let's say for example, Francis more remotely, and then Esposito who talks in more. So basically, it's also the kind of dialectics we're talking about for and remembering. It's also important in the era of memory right? So, uh, uh, so, so the point which I wanted to you to put, like, tell something about also the kind of power lesson that we have, and it can also help this number to be in uh, shaping our uh, uh, nation as well. Thank you. Yes, yes, a very good question. Thank you, Vivek. I mean, that's a very key thing in memory space, the whole idea of power and hegemonic representation. Because, as we all know, as it's self, as the you pointed out, any actual representation have a dominant version and a less dominant version, right? So, I mean, even history, for the matter, is always this story. It's someone's story from a certain vantage point, usually written by uh, the winner usually written by uh, people who have authority over knowledge. Right. So, I think, I think uh, just to condense what you asked, uh, a very good question. I think the, the key thing about memory studies is uh, the epistemic control. Right. Who controls the epistemic? Uh, who controls the, uh, the, the order of knowledge? And obviously, knowledge and memory are connected categories. Right. And as this is what Julia talks about as well, in terms of the archive, there's always this connection with the authority and the archive. Uh, if you go back to the ancient Roman times, the archive was, uh, it was, it was a very magisterial thing. It was controlled by the magistrates. It was how the magistrates, again, it has to be rooted to the markers of authority. And, and as I correctly pointed out, the whole idea of the genetic knowledge becomes interesting because you know, this is the whole point of memory study. So what gets forgotten? Uh, what, what becomes less the gymnasium? Uh, what, what becomes less dominant? But the, the funny thing, thing is, uh, this is a very immutable thing. Uh, the whole idea of what is the gymnasium today uh, might just become. Uh, so the rest of tomorrow might just become marginalized tomorrow. And we have endless examples in this history where, where certain figures are resurrected and celebrated, uh, you know, just, just to fit in the particular ideological spirits at any point in time. And even if you said figures which have been, been celebrated, which push to the margins because they are not compatible with the current uh, cultural climate. So uh, compatibility becomes a very important category in memory, especially if we're looking at memory as a macro phenomenon, as a macro activity, because it's the nexus. Of, of different kinds of parameters, the ideological parameters, the economy parameters, 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 par
uh, really important for us today because of what's happening across the world in terms of black all this matter, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the racial violence on the blacks, uh, which is almost institutionalized in America today, with the whole idea of the gun, uh, you know, the gun lobby. I think uh, even though our reality becomes a very important marker in memory study, especially uh, as a macro category, right? And this is again, we can be back to this fundamental point in memory study. The uh, constant entanglement between the body and the culture, the, the thing inside, the cells inside, the neurons inside, the body, which is biological and metabolic, and the cells, which is biological and disgusting. There's constant tensions, constant collusions, constant merge between the matter and the metaphor becomes a very important uh, deal in memory studies. Uh, because all reality is metaphorical as well. It's not just material, it's not just about the human biological body, it's about how the body is perceived as. How is the black body perceived, for example, in the white America? Right? So the whole idea of metaphorizing uh, the core reality becomes interesting and important. And the real idea this goes sort of into the reality, right? So into the reality is the economy of a thing that connects bodies together. Uh, and obviously, memory is a very, very key component of that. Too. So just again, pointing your question to the panel, uh, the panel will be a very good point uh, to look at in terms of that question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Indrajit Mukherjee. Can we implant false memories in our minds? Yeah, I mean, that is something which happens in science fiction films all the time. That is something which happens in uh, sort of white religion, like born identity, whatever. But also, culturally, uh, if, you, if you take a look at Kundera, false memories become very important in Kundera in terms of how the self sustains itself and how the self tries to recover from trauma. Right, so, uh, you know, if you want to recover from a certain traumatic memory, uh, false memories become uh, a very important uh, sort of category uh, and a very important survival strategy to a certain extent. Now, instantly, there's something called a uh, uh, pseudo or quasi remembering, you know. Uh, there's a concept which was sort of, it, it has some takers uh, at some point of time, but it's not an unfashionable quasi remembering. But I find it still interesting the idea of quasi-remembering. Quasi-remembering is memory something which may not have happened at all in the first place. Uh, so again, it's a classic false memory syndrome, right? And also, we, the idea of false memory is interesting because it looks at memory as a multi-directional activity, not just looking back at the past, but also looking back at the past in a way which would affect the future. Right? And that's the very key component of uh, memory, the, the temporal complexity of memory. So when we remember something, we're not just interested uh, in the past, that's why we're remembering, we're also interested in how we want to shape the future. Uh, that's why we need to remember in a certain kind of way, in a certain strategy kind of way. So the strategy of memory becomes important. And in that sense, false memory is a very big deal, because false memory can sometimes become a survival strategy, a very fascist. <coughs> A political state, for example, Kundera is a very good case in point, but also the false memory can also be a state strategy, a legitimate strategy, that you want to get rid of someone from a state narrative, you want to make someone disappear uh, from a legitimate narrative, so you can plan a certain place in order to make history consume a certain kind of way. So the false memory is, uh, again, it's a very micro-psychological phenomenon, it's something which the brain can sometimes do as a survival strategy, uh, but false memory can also be implanted, uh, but it's great to point out, as a cultural phenomenon in order to shape a certain kind of national history uh, in a strategic way. So yes, my answer would be a very strong yes. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the next question, asked by Sakshi Srivastava. When we look at the personal narratives of illness, memory has an important role in the selection and arrangement of events in the plot. This means there is a consistent threat of unreliability there. How does that affect the memorization of illness and the process of meaning making through the personal narrator? Yeah, excellent question, Sashi. Thank you. Very typically excellent question. So, uh, illness becomes a very important uh, condition in memory studies. And again, uh, one, one of my other research interests is medical humanities. And that's something which connects uh, very uh, consistently with memory studies. Because uh, the ill body, uh, how it remembers, and how it, more importantly, how it sequences the memory, 
becomes very, very important. And I'm not, not just talking about uh, like really medical illness like Alzheimer. I'm not talking about that. I'm also talking about how the, the, the ill body as an interrupted body. Uh, it can be interruption through trauma, it can be interruption through shut up, and also an existential closure. PTSD veterans can be a very good case in point. So how, how do trauma victims uh, remember, right? And the sequence, the, the choice of sequence becomes very, very interesting. And again, this connects to the first question about corporeality, I think. Uh, the idea of the corporeality of memory and how the intercorporeality, so how bodies remember uh, through trauma, through cultural oppression, like bodies again, become important. Uh, it becomes a very important site of memory. Uh, so to speak. So we in memory studies, we look at illness very, very seriously. Uh, illness almost as a narrative category, right? So how does the body, how does self narrate illness? And how does it connect uh, to the way uh, the ill body, the interrupted body remembers certain events, right? So uh, what happens with that particular point of time is there's obviously an amplification of certain kinds of memory, uh, a focalization of certain kinds of memory. And the focal shifts are very important. Uh, with, with illness narratives, right? So uh, the ill body, the traumatized body, in terms of how it remembers, the focal shifts become very, very important ways uh, in order to trace the memory markers become very important. And again, we're looking at uh, the entanglement of matter and metaphor. So how, how does certain matter become privileged metaphors? Because you know, we in literary studies, we know that mat metaphor is never, or the process of metaphorization is never an innocent process. Uh, it's always a complex process. Uh, what becomes metaphor is always a complex decision, a complex cognitive decision, political decision, discursive decision. So ma metaphor is obviously a non-innocent activity. Right. So the ill body, we, we need to, I mean, I think uh, the, 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 the focal point becomes highlighted in the ill body or illness narratives. So we need to take a closer attention to metaphors and illness narratives, especially in a way it relates to uh, memory studies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Kachi Chauhan. So as you mentioned about how certain historical events are dismembered or pushed away into the margins. I was wondering, can we associate this very thing with the formation of a history told by men, wherein women's narratives are omitted or put in the periphery? Yes. I mean, I did mention that the great grand uh, Meta narrative is patriarchy. I mean, that is the one grand narrative which informs every other grand narrative, religion, and nation, and uh, racism. Everything is informed by that one meta grand narrative, patriarchy. So you can read it right. The whole idea of history, and this, this goes back to my engagement with the very question the idea of epistemic control. Uh, who controls the order of knowledge? Uh, if you go back to the religious example I gave, uh, 300, uh, it's all, all about promoting a certain kind of masculinity white masculinity, which is heroic, which is glamorous, uh, which is aestheticized, the white male body is aestheticized in the film. I mean, everyone looks like, uh, you know, a fantastic male with uh, six-pack abs and perfect muscles, etc., which is obviously computer-generated uh, you know, graphics, uh, and there are graphic novels in 300 as well. So, but the whole point is how, when you look at the way in which the maleness of the epistemic control is endlessly celebrated uh, and replayed and consumed, over and over again by this very male controlled media. And this is where the whole idea of media and memory becomes interesting. And there are a lot of works which are written on media and memory. In terms of media control, uh, you know, most media institutions are controlled by men, whether it's film, cinema, radio, broadcasting, anything is controlled by men. So the grand directors which emerge uh, out of those kind of memory machines. Uh, and I use the word memory machine in a very, you know, this case, the metaphorical way. The memory machine is more often than not a male controlled machine. It's fallible centric uh, in, in a very direct way. It's controlled by men. So, again, this connects with Sakshi's question as well. Uh, the illness which happens to men uh, are obviously paid more attention. Uh, they receive grand names like PTSD, uh, post traumatic stress disorder, whereas the illness, the same kind of illness which happens to women, are relegated to hysteria, are relegated uh, to some kind of a womb disease which happens to women because obviously women are weak in nerves, uh, and men are obviously flawless in when it comes to nerves. So if we, we look at the medicalization of memory to a certain extent, and how the medicalization of memory is always gendered in quality. 
or the woman's narratives, or the woman's remembering process, is always uh, relegated as hysterical, as a mad woman's rant, etc. And how the male narrative becomes more important, uh, becomes more uh, sort of consumable uh, as the, uh, the authoritative narrative. So again, we're looking at the idea of the archive, which is very male and quality, right? So just to give you one example, uh, let's take the example of fiction. Uh, the, the, the first English novel, one of the first English novels written, uh, Robinson Crusoe, which is about this, uh, is a retelling in some sense, is the archetypal narrative about white male uh, territorialization, the white man taking over non white space, uh, rescuing the non white uh, uh, native, uh, who is obviously a savage, a cannibal, giving the person a name, taking control, etc., etc., etc. And it's obviously a male narrative. Uh, it just goes on, and we have uh, endless examples of Crusoe talking about how it takes over the island, uh, as an endless supply of gunpowder and Bible. You know, uh, the ship of Crusoe is funny. Uh, it just keeps applying in gunpowder and Bibles. And it stays only when he has endless gunpowder to take over uh, the island. And of course, with the gunpowder, it creates a plantation. It's the white male fantasy of creating the territory of the empire. It's the first empire in fiction, uh, in English fiction. Right? But the interesting thing is, look at the absence of women in Robinson Crusoe. Uh, it's all about this male project, this male fantasy of, you know, it's also a memory narrative, if you remember it. It's Crusoe telling us what happened to him uh, in a particular island, right? And those of us who have suffered the novel uh, with all this boredom would know that there are endless pages where Crusoe describes the building of fence, uh, how he builds the fence and how he builds. Each nail is described in graphic details, how the fence is built, the formidable territory, etc., etc. Right? And that has given so much attention. But towards the end of the novel, we just have one half sentence where Crusoe says, Oh, by the way, when I came back to England, I got married, my wife produced three sons, and then she died. That's it. Uh, There's a complete disappearance of the woman. The only uh, function that a woman has in that male fantasy is to produce more males, right? And then she disappears from the sentence, from the novel, and also from Crusoe's life. And that is a very interesting symbolic uh, narrative structure, I think, which connects to this question uh, in terms of how the female narrative, or how the female presence uh, becomes a problem and becomes incompatible uh, with the monolithic, hegemonic male narrative which informs the memory machine in Robinson Crusoe as well as in 300. So we see a complete legacy of male control uh, in terms of white male control, to be more honest, to be more specific. Because you know, this is why racism, gender, they all combine together, the new together, uh, to create this uh, meta-capitalist framework uh, of memory machines. Uh, how are we supposed to remember uh, certain incidents? But it's obviously controlled by patriarchy. And as I mentioned, and this is a connection to uh, Sarchi's question before, the medicalization of memory is also very sexist in quality. It's also very gendered in quality. Uh, it's always a mad woman's narrative compared with the traumatic man's narrative. Right? The traumatic man receives medical attention, and he has a classification, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which only came into being with the Vietnam War. Prior to that, uh, you know, any act of domestic trauma was relegated to hysteria, a warm disease. So we can see how the sexism is operated in terms of medical classification. And it also informs uh, the memory machines today in terms of the institutions of memory. So I think it's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The uh, next question. Yes, sir. I think, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I yes. think uh, Abhishek uh, is occupied somewhere else. Yeah. We, will, we will just take one last question. That would be great. Thanks, Vivek. Yeah, yes. that's it. Yeah. Okay, okay, sir. sure. So the next question is by Ananya Bhattacharya. Sir, I have been broadly working on the topic obliterated histories and gendered militancy, Naxalbari movement in Bengal and Bangladesh Liberation War, 1967 to 1971. When it comes to talking about the narrative about Birangonas, don't you think there has been a gap in the combination of the empirical and effective point of view as the Birangonas, in spite of being valorized with this state-sponsored tag of being the warrior woman, still haven't got their due from the state as well as the society? Yes, excellent question. Uh, I have a friend from Durham, I'm sure, uh, Ananda, you've heard of her work, uh, Nainika Mukherjee. Uh, 
Uh, she has this very interesting book called The Spectral Wound, which is exactly on the Virabhyam than a woman in Bangladesh. And the reason why she titled, and we had her over an item address a couple of years ago, is one of the earlier uh, events in memory studies uh, research cluster. So her, if you haven't read that work, I do recommend it very, very heavily, The Spectral Wound by Nainika Mukherjee from Durham. Uh, which talks about the spectrality of the Biangana woman. And as you very correctly pointed out, uh, they haven't classified with a name for the type of Biangana. But it's also this sort of spectral quality about them. They're not really uh, brought into the mainstream. They're still there in some sort of spectral, marginalized characters. And again, this has something to do with the gendered quality. And this connects to the previous question as well. Uh, the idea of the Biangana as a celebrated woman uh, you know, heroines of the world, etc. But the idea of the fallen woman is still there uh, as a residual category, right? That hasn't quite disappeared. Right? Uh, these are women who are uh, raised and mutilated and tortured. Uh, and so the, the political classification of giving them a heroic status there, but the sentimental uh, uh, reception of them still combines the fallen woman trope. I think, and this is what Monica uh, talks about in her book. So I do recommend that book very heavily if you haven't read it. But I think, I think your question, question is very good. good. Uh, and it connects to, again, the key thing we do in memory studies uh, the, uh, the politics of reception, the politics of consumption, and how do you consume something that happened through history books, through perceptions. And perceptions, of course, are manufactured and disseminated. So the Virangona is a very interesting metaphor uh, in terms of how there is this. Uh, apparently, celebration quality about them, but the fallen woman quality is, is still there as some type of residual presence, as a marker uh, of fallen which, 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 which makes it complicated. Category, so, it's an excellent question. And do, do read Nanika's work if you haven't already. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I now invite Manika to present her formal mode of facts. Good morning. Uh, we, we never thought, thought that we would have a chance, chance to interact with, with not just, just a scholar, scholar but an, an expert, expert on uh, memory, memory studies. studies. And who would uh, uh, flag, flag before, before us such, such questions? questions. And, uh, as, as a student, student we, we must be aware of today. And, and we are glad, glad to have, have you with us, sir. Thank, Thank you so, so much to incite us on discovering the new ideas regarding, regarding the functioning of our memory and, and the, how, how it is related to literature. And we want you to be with us and engage us on more such talks in the times to come. Uh, on behalf of Intersections, Banaras and University, uh, I would like to extend many thanks to you and for, for being, being a part of this online lecture series and I thank you for sharing your time and ideas with us and it was a matter of great pleasure for all of us to listen to you. Thank you so much and I would also like to thank all the participants for their for making this pleasant session. I hope uh, we meet again and again with some new ideas and with new topics. So, Thank, Thank you very much for inviting me, and I do hope you visit the Narasimha University in person and have a non virtual engagement with all of you in the office. Stay safe, everyone, and take care. Thank you.